Welcome to The Future of Impact, a show where we create solutions and build a world where missions, metrics, and incentives align to actually get problems solved. We are on a mission to find innovative ways to accelerate change and make impact in industry. But we can't do it without the right metrics, and we can't do it alone. This is not a job for one or even for a few. We all stand to succeed by working together. We are the future of impact. I'm your host, Jess Merrill. Let's get started. Chrissy Webb is the co-founder and executive director of Student ACES, which stands for Athletics, Community, and Education. They're a 501c3 organization that was started by Chrissy and her dad, Buck Martinez, in 2013. Their mission is to inspire and develop high school student athletes to become men and women of character, honor, and integrity through their character education programs. Chrissy lives in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, with her husband and twin daughters, and in complete transparency, we are friends. We went to high school together. My family's foundation also supports student ACEs um, from a behavioral health standpoint. And so I just feel like we should put that out there, but so excited <laughs> to have you. And we have had so many conversations over all the years, and I'm just so excited to put this on a on a big stage and to really be able to highlight the incredible work that you guys are doing. I think that the, you know, the really the kind of like, inspiration or like thing that I'm so excited about having you speak to, because it's what we really look up to you guys for from an industry perspective is this idea of building an organization through the lens of the next generation and really like kind of nailing and like knocking out of the park, pun intended, the like community up approach, you know, first of all, thank you. Welcome. Excited to have you. Thanks for having me, Jess. And I'd love for you to just kind of start with like, your story, like you're finding your purpose, your path to where you're at today with student aces. Cause I think that for so many people, you know, depending on where you're at in your life, that you assume that it's kind of the straight arrow, you know, path to where people are to achieving success. And, um, I know your story, so I know it wasn't that, but I would love for people to be able to just kind of hear about how you got here. Sure. So, so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, and it's fun because I feel like I'm with you, just, you know, for those of you who don't know, just moved. And so we usually do this together <laughs> places, but um, it's, it's really nice to be here with you, just and see your face always. So the story, you know, for those that, you know, go through, I would say life and growing up and you don't know, I was one of those that never knew what I wanted to do. I um, had different degrees. I went to school that I wanted to be business, that I wanted psychology, that I wanted public health, um, ended up psychology and public health. I wanted to be a sports psychologist at, at some point. Um, but the bigger picture, the passion was serving others. And so throughout different jobs and career paths and so on and so forth. Um, when I had my daughters, I have twins, they're 10 now. I always started the organization in 2013. So they're babies and my dad and I were driving and um, the conversation was who are my daughters going to look up to and what does that look like? And what are they doing to prepare this next generation to lead our country. And so what turned into just talking back and forth and my dad was at the power company for 30 plus years. Um, I said, Hey dad, what's next? You know, like what, what happens after, after working <laughs> with a company for so long? And um, my dad coached all of our teams. He's one of those that my friends would come to my house just to hang out with my dad <laughs> And my mom, I would, I would come home and all my friends were there. I was like, what? And they would just be hanging out. So he always had that, um, that magnetic personality that would always mentor kids and bring on athletes to Florida Power and Light and really develop um, these young leaders. So what started a conversation in U-Haul, fast forward to now um, student ACEs. So we had piloted program and now we've served over 50,000 high school student athletes in different capacities. So that's the story in a nutshell. That's awesome. And I, you know, have been so grateful to be a part of it for all these years and just am so inspired by what you guys do and have, you know, it's, it's unfortunately rare, although I'm going to make it a, a point to, you know, be spending more time with all the guests that we have on this show, but like to be able to to, you know, be talking with you and expressing to everybody when I have been like hands-on, like in the room while you guys are, you know, doing the programming and kind of like working with these kids and just to see everything that's happened over the past, you know, almost decade is incredible. I think that the thing that always stands out to me and, you know, my family and I, you know, as the board of our family foundation talk about this all the time is 
how you guys not just talk the talk about letting the community and the people you serve be the voice of all decisions that are made, but like you guys, it is, and, and in a very innovative way and are always kind of pivoting and learning and figuring out, talk to me a little bit about this idea of listening to the people you serve and how it only, like, how does it work or not work? Or how have you experienced that over years when you kind of like did that and how, how did it come to life versus maybe times where you guys experienced it not being that way. Like what is the power of listening to the people you serve? Well, <laughs> the power is everything um, in listening. So, you know, I always tell all the kids that I coach from 10 years old to high school kids and then the alumni, um, you were born with two ears and one mouth, right? So the importance of listening <laughs> and the the ability to, and then take what you, and everybody listens and learns in different ways, right? And then take it and do something with it, right? Somebody's telling you something for a reason. Um, so when, when we started the organization, we relied on those messages from the kids to lead the way. And we didn't find many organizations that were doing that. So, you know, a lot of organizations are based on research, which is fine. There's no, absolutely nothing wrong. You know, there's different situations where you have to rely on this research, but what would happen is we would be talking to the kids and then it would match research. So we were moving with the students that we were serving. So things would pop up and discussions that they were experiencing and also technology is changing so fast too. So that's what we would find is that, you know, some organizations or companies would be working on something for so long in the technology space that they were currently in that they didn't prepare for what would happen down the road. So, you know, we focused tremendous, we didn't even, at the time, we didn't even know that that was our model. We just did it. Um, so everything we just did was that listening and then acting, right? Based on what this population that we served was saying to us. Obviously, you know, they're high school students and, um, you know, there's some things that you know later in life, but what through their lens, you have to put yourself in their shoes for a second and say, well, they're understanding it this way. So how are we going to best serve what we know and what these experts know and what the people that we have relationships with know to best provide the communication that these kids need. Um, so that was, that's everything. And we've taken that over nine years, we've taken that model and that model has not changed. It's interesting. Like I just, the fact that you guys went from, was the first class 60, was it like 60 kids, 65 kids? 32. 32. All right. So 32. listen to this, everybody. 32 kids in their program. And involved with student aces nine years ago. And what was the number that you've met? What was the number you just said again? 50,000. 50,000. Like, first of all, let's just pause about that for a minute because <laughs> that's nuts. And talk yeah. to me about why specifically you guys target and kind of like work with and focus on the student athlete, the student high school athlete specifically. Well, I think companies and, and organizations, they try to do a lot, right? You try to serve as many people as you can, but when you find your what your strength is, right? So I was an athlete. My sisters were athletes. There's a different experience, work ethic, individual sports, team sports, et cetera, et cetera, that drive, right? And the fact that the student body looks up to the student athlete, whether it's good behavior or bad behavior, if you can emulate the good behaviors amongst your leaders in the school, then you can create positive behavior change amongst the whole student body. And those that was when we were talking to a lot of the school administrators. That was the common message was how do I get, you know, those kids that the student body looks up to, to be those leaders with the right behaviors, not the negative. Because there's some leaders that have not the right behaviors and that affects the student body as well. Right. Talk to me about the evolution of the programming from, you know, kind of how you first started. And I think there's a really interesting story around understanding systems and the systems that you work within and the benefits of them and the constraints or limitations of them. And I think that from a practical standpoint, because I would say everybody in the world, but and you know, but specific to this audience, you know, people supporting or running nonprofit organizations, systems is a huge part of like the ecosystem of the work that they do. Sure. The evolution of the of the thirty two and what kind of how that was all like how that started, and then how you guys have evolved your relationship with, and then who are the systems in your ecosystem, and then who, how have you guys evolved those relationships? Sure. Well. Anybody that knows us um, knows that we don't take no for an answer very well. So <laughs> when you talk about the education system or 
um, government systems or those things that are so used to doing things in a certain way, right? So when we when we started um, and we we took those 32 students from different schools, um, we said one of the most important things that we think is going to be the biggest impact is going to be to have students from all different schools in one setting. So you need to excuse these kids from school, <laughs> bring them, transport them to one location, and we're going to have them out of school for the whole day. They look at you like, okay, <laughs> you know, how are you? This is like from the beginning, like when you guys are just starting out and people are like, do you, what? You're crazy. Eight different schools, public yeah. school, private school, charter schools, the homeschooled kids. I mean, we wanted the biggest thing for us was to bring kids from different backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities into one setting to work through this character, right? So this case studies and interaction and real situations that high school students are dealing with. If you're surrounded by the same people day in and day out, and that's all you're exposed to, how are you going to be best prepared for the real world and in business situations and dealing with people from different communities and cultures and backgrounds? So that was huge for us. Um, but those systems, you know, again, going back to when you're dealing with an education system or systems that run and operate a certain way, it's very hard. You know, the way that a lot of the systems are trained is to, this is what I do. This is how it goes. So you throw off everything because shocks the system, but we would keep showing up and we said, okay, well, this is going to happen. So how are we going to do this? Right? Because something has to change the way that you know, the, the, and, and again, it's nothing against the education system. They're only doing as much as they can handle, right? Your guidance counselors are inundated with kids and situations. And, and so how do you provide those key resources that these kids need to contribute to their schools? Um, and we said, you know, at the end of the day, these kids are getting excused to go to a football game if they're playing. So why isn't it just as important to be part of a character class and developing these kids so that they have opportunities, right? So it's all about opportunity, right? Systems sometimes that opportunity and that giving them that different experience. You know, a lot of student athletes, and I'll say this too, before I start going down another path, but um, a lot of student athletes do not get to participate in national honor society or clubs after school or exposed to those different things. So um, again, bringing them together, giving them those tools that they need to be leaders and then they go out and change systems themselves. Yeah. You're you're developing them as people to be able to be leaders, to go out and shock different systems and, and create that positive change. How was it? So you, so you mentioned, obviously, in the beginning, people were like, you're crazy. Like, sure. And probably dismissive so, a little bit. Um, so. And then the fact <laughs> that like you didn't go anywhere and you just kept pushing on it, like this is going to happen. Um, how has it evolved and kind of where is it today now that you're very established, obviously you've been very successful, have expanded to multiple other counties, your alumni are all over the country, probably all over the world, you know, whether they continue to play sport or whether they just went on to be successful humans, where, how is that relationship now? Or like, how has it evolved? So you find your champions, right? Champions. Actually, today I'm sitting in a class. Uh, had our first class of the school year with 70 student athletes from all different schools. Your champions, whether they're alumni, key business professionals, people in the school, do you find those champions that know these kids, right? So you have sometimes it's the lady that works in the lunchroom that she sees these leaders in a different way than maybe the principal because the principal is so busy. So it's like, so you have all these people that know the outcomes. They've experienced the program. Um, you know, their little sisters are growing up or their brothers or so it becomes this network, right? This huge network, like you mentioned, of students that are all over the country, whether they're playing not and outside of the country. I have a couple of kids out overseas, um, whether most don't play a sport in college. I mean, that is a rare, you know, however, every opportunity, again, they capitalize on it and they, they, they're successful people in whatever capacity that is. So that becomes easier and easier because you have a track record. You have students. I mean, you can watch a football, football Saturday for college football, and I have kids playing all over. And the way that they conduct themselves in their media interviews or they go get a job, you know, those are all things that represent the organization. Yeah. So you have, you know, you have your outcomes, which is so important for, for nonprofit. 
Oh, good segue. Didn't even have that one teed up, but you know, it's my favorite conversation. This is what Christy and I talk most about. And I didn't even have it on our, like what we were going to talk about, which is like, shame on me. Oh, no. Yeah, that it is. Well, we didn't even see, talk yeah, about it. Automatically comes up. Because I know. Good. See, even if we try to avoid it. Okay. So outcomes, you and I have spoken about outcomes for probably, I don't know, seven of the, of the nine years you guys have been doing this since you and I got started working together on different projects. How do you guys measure outcomes and how has that evolved over time, both as like the organization has grown and evolved, but also as your relationship with funders and kind of as you've kind of gotten your feet underneath you and have like, uh, really understand like what the needs of the students and the program are. Do you hear a lot of students in the background right now? Yeah, they're getting so authentic. They're getting dismissed um, from the class today. (laughs) Um, Now people really know she really is leading a student led organization. (laughs) They have nowhere to go because it's pouring outside. Okay. So again, apologize. So so outcomes, you know, we didn't fundraise as an organization for the first two years because we wanted to make sure that it worked. Um, and our, you know, we're very proud of the work. We're There's not a lot of people that are going to outwork um, my dad and I. We're both, I am cut from the same cloth. Um, my grandparents came here from Cuba, worked for everything that they have, that drive and that work ethic. So I don't even know where I was going with outcomes, but we didn't raise money for the first two years because we wanted to make sure that it worked. So then we kept hearing, I mean, this was all organic. I mean, I Googled how to write bylaws for nonprofits. And I mean, it was all self-taught because I, my thought going into it was how am I going to ever train a staff if I don't know the ins and the outs of what I'm operating um, as a co-founder and executive director. So we always heard outcomes are so important. Outcomes are so important. You know, you have to track things. You have, well, when you're just starting out, I know all the kids that we, I mean, I I don't know how hundreds and hundreds of kids. I know stories about them because I know them. But then again, you know, as you grow, you know, 60 turns into a thousand real quick. Um, You're saying, wait, where are you getting these numbers from? And so then when we started taking outcomes of the kids the numbers and, and different things, they, they would, you know, I would hear from funders, well, how do you, you know, are their GPAs going up? I'm like, I don't know, but they're great kids. I mean, look at all the things that they're doing. You know, they're hopeful and they have, you know, strong character and they're confident. Well, they would say, well, we don't know how to measure that. Again, a system thing. Um, we don't know how to measure hope. I'm like, well, if you spend five minutes with these kids, you'll, you know, come on a visit. Well, we normally just take applications through the portal. I'm like, okay, great. So then we had to figure out how to capture this, right? Which has been ongoing. It's how do you capture this confidence and hope? And and, and we've found, uh, Jess introduced us to um, Hello Insight, which we use, but there's different programs and we've had to get very creative and we're able to finally figure out how to capture some of those things through testimony, when you get testimonials or when you get, you know, you can say, okay, you know, for all these nonprofits that are watching, you can look at research and say, okay, by given confidence, young people are more likely to be successful in this way, right? So then it matches that. So you can't get too bogged down on, if you're a nonprofit and you're listening, you can't get too bogged down on what exactly. So you have to know that you're putting in the work, know that you you don't know when it's going to stick, right? Because you may have the kid, the student for three workshops or a year, but then they go off and it sticks five years down the road. So you have to be very, um, you have to know that, yes, you are changing lives. You don't know when. Um, And sometimes you have to let, you know, there's, you know, different individuals that you give everything you got, but, you know, again, that's what makes us all individuals. So, so I would say, you know, the main thing is just making sure that whatever you're capturing Make sure that there's a purpose and it's linked to something that you're that you're connecting to, whether that be what are, you know whatever you're looking to to show. Staying away from drugs and alcohol, or the confidence, or the hope, or whatever that is that you're teaching is linked to that outcome that you're trying to show. Right? Yeah, it, it's interesting. It makes me think of a. Um, I interviewed the CEO of an organization um, called Dog Tag Bakery that they, do you know Megan Ogilvie from Dog Tech Bakery? I sounds familiar. Okay. So they work with um, military veterans and spouses on like on supporting their transition back into civilian life. And we had this conversation and we started talking about, uh, she called it mission creep. 
Yeah. And how like with the, you know, funding and kind of like all the outside expectations and thoughts and whether that comes from funders or your board members or whatever, not the community that you are very, you start off very clear with like what you're, who you serve and how you best serve them. And then to meet the needs of all these outside voices, you start to like, oh, we'll launch this program to fulfill this grant application or, oh, we'll do this extra thing because this large donor, you know, like asked if we could do this too. And all of a sudden, like what was crystal clear that served your organization's mission now is like, what do you guys do? And like, where, you know, like, and I'm sure that that takes a lot of confidence and discipline and like kind of revisiting, like, what does that look like for you guys from a, you know, we, we've talked a lot about over the years, this idea of like cycle, right? Like you kind of the cycle you run through, which I'm sure was like looked one way nine years ago and then has evolved, but it's like, you've, you've mentioned it like listening, real-time learning and application, assessing and analyzing, and then innovation. Like how do you fit innovation into all of that? Can you speak a little bit to that process for you guys? Sure. And, you know, as an organization, we've, we failed so many times and that's where you see growth again, you know, being very passionate and driven by the students that you serve. Sometimes <laughs> if you're like my father and I go down different paths in your life, cause you want to help every kid. So what does that look like? And then you're changing things. Right. And you know, our operations, if you know, our operations, I mean, director Becca, she's amazing. She's incredible. I mean, I want to make sure that since everyone needs a Becca, cause she's phenomenal. Um, she would look at us like, wait, so is this going to be a program? And we would say, you know, um, but you can't get too tied, you know, as an organization, you can't get so hung up on something because if it doesn't, you have to acknowledge like that might not be the best fit. However, in listening and pivoting and filling a, a gap, you also have to be very flexible. So when there is a need that needs to be filled, you have to be ready to respond because that's what you do as an organization and as a nonprofit, you know, each nonprofit's goal should be to go out of business because you're working on a much bigger impact. So again, those different places that you're taking, yes, you have to come back to your, you have to center, you have to come back and say, is, does this fit into the overall mission of the organization? And if it does, then you have to say, okay then you have to lay out that path for that. And again, we just went through a strategic planning three to five years and our strategic plan this year didn't change much from the direction. We just have to get very solid in our capacity evaluation. Those key factors that we, you know, if something happens to, to me as the executive director or God forbid anyone that somebody knows exactly how to run the organization, which is just as important. So you go from, you know, there's, I call it a cycle of nonprofits, but you go from building and building and building and everything's, you know, going great. And you're very, you become very comfortable in this like smaller organization, but then you grow and then it's very uncomfortable again. And it's like, okay, now I have to do what? I have these reports and I have to, but this might not look like this. This is worded different. And this is not, you know, doesn't let me play freely in this space. How do I do that? You know, and so again, you know, seeing our organization grow and it's like, you have to sometimes take a step back and you have to say, okay, is this a good fit? Does this, because then once you become a known organization, there's a lot of organizations and people that try to, to collaborate, right? So in that, you know, you can't change your model or what you stand behind or what you stand firm in your mission just to, we've had to let several grants, big grants go because it didn't. We weren't going to change who we are and who we serve or what we do just to fit into that space. And that is hard to learn. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that it brought up for me when you were talking about it, the kind of like you're growing and then you're, then you kind of level off and you feel comfortable and then you go through a burst of growth again and it feels uncomfortable. It's just like, it made me just think of particularly where I'm at in my life right now. It's just like the human experience, right? Yeah. Like the organization is like its own kind of like living and breathing organism of like you start off and you don't really know what you're doing and just like, you don't have to be uncomfortable all the time. But when you're like comfortable for too long, it's like, oh, maybe you need to push, you know, like maybe you're, you need to get to the next growth stage, but it is like a hard, like it's a sludge to like get through okay. it and then to get, and then you get to the other side and then you look back and you're like, oh, wow, I remember when we were, you know, like the yeah. thought of probably having 32 kids right now is bananas to you from where you're at now, you know, and everything you've gone through. But at one point, the idea of having 50,000 kids probably would have been like unfathomable. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's in different capacities too, right? So you have, sometimes you know that you're working with 300 kids in one 
auditorium setting and you're speaking and it's not as interactive. So then your, your levels of impact are different, right? So if you have the same students five to like our flagship program that we had today, we have the same students throughout the school year, five or six times. Um, we get to know those kids very well. Um, and so that level of impact is different. It's going to be different than the student that you had just for two hours in one workshop. So you have to gauge it based on that, you know, so with those two hours, you have those two hours to change that kid's life. So what are you going to do with it and how are you going to do it? Um, so figuring that out as well is there's different roadmaps, right? And sometimes the roadmap doesn't always go how you plan it. So speaking of which, <laughs> talk to me about, I just think this is a very good practical example. And it's like, not one that I really touch on too much. Cause I kind of feel like we're like out of it and like, we don't want to like focus so much on the past or whatever, but like, I think as it relates specifically to a, a bunch of verticals in our industry, but youth development organizations for a variety of reasons had a very challenging past two and a half years. Yeah. I think it's a perfect like segue from the idea of like being flexible, the, uh, you know, pivot, which is like the most overused word, but like that idea of like, you think you're in a comfortable place. I remember the conversations we were having about like, and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And then, you know, March 15th comes mm -hmm. and the world shuts down. Mm -hmm. And like, just from a, from an understanding perspective, because when you talk about, which I will ask you to kind of like where you guys are at today, and it's going to seem so like they went from 32 to 50,000. And, and then we talk about all these wins and all this, all this, but like what happens in the course of that first year for you guys? And like, how did you deal with that? So again, those honest conversations and that real taking a look and saying, okay, is this going to be, yes, we have to fulfill this and do our classes and all of this we're supposed to do, but is it going to work out? So we were close to finishing like our flagship. So the same kids that we had. So we had a, a program, right? We were supposed to have a champions of character. It's where we bring in the best of the best of the students that worked super hard. They're recognized as those leaders. That usually happens in May. So we don't, you can't go any, at this point, everything was shut down and then caravan started. So we're looking at this going, okay, how are we going to continue to impact these lives and everything shut down, right? And then we did a couple Zoom calls and the kids were, it was almost worse. That we, you know, again, every organization has different experiences, but for us, it was like these kids, you know, for us to just be on a screen, it was not, they would shut it down. Is it really connecting? You know, so what we found was that just checking in with those kids and having those kids check in with other kids that maybe weren't even in our program was more beneficial. Um, and then we have a center. We have one physical location as an organization. It's, it's in a place called Belglade, which is very West. A lot of people are, it's known the muck. Uh, a lot of football players, a lot of athletes come out of their very impoverished community. Bank of America donated a building to us out there and, and it's an after school program. So we're open every single day. Those kids were experiencing extremely different circumstances. So a lot of our alumni that were playing football, different colleges and universities were home for spring break without anything, no computers, no, no, no nothing. They were just home for spring break and football, you know, everything was shut. Down. The schools didn't go back. Not, so these kids had no place to train. They had no place to do their schoolwork. They had no internet at home, a lot of them. So we used our location, which is normally an after school program. We open up at two o'clock as a distance learning center, which meant that we were opening at 7 a.m. so that these kids could do, be in their classes. And that, so that was serving our alumni or college kids and our current high school students. So, and, you know, we were being pressured to shut down. We own the building, but our, you know, we, we had a real tough call to say, okay, what are the risks, right? What are the risks? And again, this is just where we were being completely honest and transparent was there was kids getting murdered. There were one of, we lost one of our students that was shot and murdered in the streets. So there was all of these things because, you know, you talk about mental health situations, you talk about you no know, social interaction, you know, or their home life isn't the best, so there's no outlets. So we decided to stay open. We said, we said, okay, let until everybody can provide internet and computers so that these kids can be successful, we're going to continue to do what, what we can do. And we'd get calls, you know, oh, your kids are outside, outside exercising. And, you know, some of these kids, their only way to the next level is through football, unfortunately. Yeah. So you have a starting wide receiver at one of the big schools. They can't exercise because they were being sent home if they were running, you know, exercising around the 
the area or so on and so forth. So we decided to stay open and, and that became the impact in that moment, right? So yes, we've talked about big numbers and we've talked about, yes, in the center, you know, it's a small city. We have 60 to 100 students. We have students all over. But in that moment, we had to focus on what we knew to be the most impact at that time while continuing to impact others and, you know, staying in touch and listening and trying to do what we could. Um, and then from there, uh, as you know, we've talked about this, we have developed new programming that emerged from that because we started to see the gaps in those edu- in the education system. So what we did as an organization, we took what the very high performing private schools are doing to ensure that these kids graduate. So we took some of the highest performing private schools and put that into a program that the students in this community can do on their own to get better each day, to have that opportunity that others have, that equitable opportunity Um, and systems change. That's where that happens. So COVID, I mean, we're just back bringing all the kids together. Today was the first day after two and a half, two years. (laughs) Um, And so it feels really good to be back, but yeah, it's really hard. And we don't even know, like we've talked about, we've had many conversations about, you know, what are the, what does it look like in the mental health space and the behavior? Like, what does that look like in the social, social interactions and social skills? What does that look like? We have no idea yet. Yeah. We're just scratching this. We will, I will have more to report once the class continues on each month, but we're just scratching the surface on on what the impact of that on these kids is. Well, I'm excited to have you and Kim Flores. Maybe we'll do a you know former show guest to do a combo <laughs> once you guys get you know. Th- and this was that was really like the purpose of doing the show was just about like we're having these conversations on a one to one basis regularly, talking about opportunities, challenges, you know, ways to innovate, you know, things that we wish we could say to funders, stuff like that. And it was like, well, let's just have that conversation. You know, I have no skin in the game. Like I don't have to, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, like I don't have to play by any rules. So it was like, let's have these conversations in a way that's productive because what I found more often than not, or almost a hundred percent of the time was like, everyone's trying to accomplish the same thing. Sure. It's just that everyone, depending on where you're coming from, from all different points of view, like you just are like the approach to get there looks really different. And so what does it look like if we, and so I'm so excited that you guys, you know, are working with Hello Insight because I just, you know, the data that is going to come out of that and the power of that to be able to kind of guide not only for your organization, but funders and the way that they look at other organizations. So we'll have to, we'll have to do a combo episode at some point once you guys get some, some good data in there. So the next thing I wanted to talk about And this kind of goes into like, I think it's really interesting when you talk about the passport program that was developed coming out of, you know, the past two and a half years. And then what we haven't touched on yet directly, because I think you guys have such an innovative approach to your partnerships with funders. Well, one would be like, how did you guys fund the first two years, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody listening right now, that's a founder, executive director, you know, starting from that in that first two year window, we get these calls all the time. People are like, just started this organization or I started this organization a year ago and I want to start doing grants. And we're like, Ooh, probably not a good idea. So we say, I mean, we, we end up saying kind of like, no, for lack of a better word, nine times out of 10, because that's not the best use. Just like I wouldn't say to somebody just starting a business, like go get a bank loan or go get, you know, like take out a line of credit when you haven't figured out what it is that you're actually doing to know that you can you know, responsibly manage that money and get a return on that investment. But like, what does it look like from that whole path, the funding path, basically? Like who supported you in the beginning? When did you guys start to get involved in different funding, you know, like outlets or kind of like sources of revenue? And like, how have you scaled? Because your financial trajectory has been on par, like it's matched the programming side. And I think that's an important lesson for people to understand like how you guys did that and like with such an entrepreneurial approach. Sure. So my father funded it again. I mean, I was not getting paid in as, as an executive director. So blood, sweat, and tears, we did everything ourselves again, you know, everything from, you know, where organizations would hire attorneys to write bylaws and, you know, file their articles of incorporation. I did that myself um, because I believed in the, the mission and the vision. I didn't sleep. I'm not recommending it. I had twin twin little babies at the time too. Um, so when they would nap, I would be working on it. I mean, I believed in everything so much. So there's no, 
you know, and I, I say this as nicely as possible. There's absolutely no magic answer. There isn't. It's a lot of hard work. It's hours and hours and a lot of being told no. So, you know, within the first two years, you know, those costs that we incurred, it was people that believed in the mission. So we had a couple, you know, individuals that we knew from, you know, my dad knew from working in the business sector. And I knew as well, because I had a lot of contacts in the community that we work in. I still, you know, have a lot of contacts there. I grew up in the same community. So those people that believed in us, you know, started writing those $500 checks and those $1,000 checks. And then when you have those stories and you're so passionate about it, that you can bring it back to them and you can say, this is how this shows up. That's where the, you know, then they start telling other people. And I started writing the grants myself. So I didn't wait for a grant writer. I, I, I did it myself. I was told no a lot of times. And then I started, then I was starting to hear yes. And so how do you, you know, when you get told no, are you just going to shut down and not do it again? So you ask them why, you know, what is the feedback? How can I get better? And, you know, Bank of America, the first several years I would meet and they would tell me, they would tell me no. And then they ended up giving us a building. We ended up winning Neighborhood Builders, which was a $200,000 two-year grant. I was just part of the selection committee. So you, you build those relationships. And I think one thing for us, when we talk about relationships, relationships, genuine relationships where you can have those conversations where, you know, whether they say, no, I'm not going to fund you because you're honest. You have to be okay with that sometimes of saying, so, you know, you go to different, I would, I would go to all of these, you know, conferences and, and, and everything's perfect, right? Everything, our youth are great. The school systems are great. Everything's perfect. And I'm saying, wait a second, but how are we going to change? How I want to go somewhere where people are going to say, this is the hard issue. And how are we going to work in that space of really being honest with what the issues are? And then we're going to work to change it. But you know, be, having those conversations of like, let's dive into the real hard things. That's where, you know, you build those relationships with those funders who are going to say, you know what, I love what they do. I'm going to support them. I'm going to introduce them. And then you have some people where, you know, you get funded for a year and that's great. And we, you know, but then they decide to go in a different direction as an organization, or maybe, you know, we hear sometimes, oh, we don't like that you just serve athletes. Well, we, we don't just serve athletes in Belle Glade. We, we are open to all the kids in the community, but you know, again, they have their missions too. So how do you find that genuine relationship with those individuals that can give you, you know, your blind spots and that feedback, whether it's what you want to hear, where you don't want to hear, you give us take, you know, I always love when the board challenges me. I love, love, love when I get questions, when I get hard questions, because if I continue to hear, you're doing great, you're doing great. Okay. Like I want somebody to say, you know what, this is the area that you need to work on. This is how you can improve. So look for those people who are going to, those that are going to drive you and I'm competitive too, right? If you tell yeah. me no. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not not going to quit until I, you know. Thank you for that feedback. And now I'm not stuffing. Talk to me about the board. Um, I think that this is, you know, a conversation that is really interesting because I think that from what you just said, I was making, I like popped in my head that I was like, I guess a board could kind of serve three things, right? Like they could be not involved at all. And then therefore like, you know, maybe disadvantageous for different reasons. than if they're like, so involved at the point of like, not being able to like give the feedback and then kind of like let the leadership move. How do you find that sweet spot? How did you kind of, how did you initially build your board? How has it evolved and how did they support you? What is their involvement and how do they kind of support you in you know, that feedback and kind of like pushing things forward. So in building a board, you know, at first it's, it's the people that, you know, they're your champions, a core few people that believe in the, in the mission, the vision. Actually, our board was interesting in the beginning because we started to hear, oh, I don't think you should grow it more than 50 kids. Like, well, our job is to impact as many freaking kids as possible because, you know, and that's not the direction. So we had, we ended up bringing some different board members because that in the, we wanted people that were going to tell, tell us, yes, 100% and, how, and let's do it. Like, how are we going to do it? How are we going to grow? How are we going to scale? I don't want to be told no. We have to, you know, stop at X. So with that, we had a small board at first. Then I think one of the most important things about when you start growing your board is to have board members that represent the communities that you're working in. So when we start, we started in Palm Beach County. We grew, you know, for those from South Florida, we grew to Broward, grew to Miami. So then we started, you know, looking in those 
different areas to see who could represent those areas on our board. And that was key. And as we grew and scaled and had more students, and then we have the building in Belglade, now we have about, I think it's 17 board members, business community, business, a lot of business sector, um, because that's just, again, knowing how you operate as an organization. My, my father's from the business background, a lot of years in the business background, and that's how I grew up as well. So a lot of different individuals that are big cut Florida Blue, Florida Power and Light, and a lot of business, you know, individuals, and then nonprofit leaders and funders. So you want to make sure that you diversify your board as much as possible. Some professional athletes, because that's the voice of the athlete, right? <laughs> so they've been through it. Um, so we've, we've done, I think we've done a really good job in having board members from the populations that we serve. What does, as we kind of start to to wrap up here of the interview portion of this conversation, what does, so you guys have had such amazing growth and success, obviously through, you know, learnings, through failures, through wins, all that stuff. What does, you mentioned you did your strategic plan for the next three to five years. If we go beyond that, do you guys think beyond that? And if so, what does that look like for you and your dad? I mean, for us, it, it, the more students that you impact, the more that you have all over. So you scale naturally throughout the country. <laughs> so the hope is that, you know, we start to develop our alumni port, you know, product of student aces. So if you're, you know, an ace of alumni and you're in the business sector and you're in a community that, you know, students can, you know, that you want to go out and inspire and develop student athletes in your community. I mean, that's the those key phrases like the voice of the student athlete and work ethic second to none and aspiring to greatness, those the day that that happens in different communities, which we already start to hear it with some of our students that have been through the program, that's where you say, okay, this is, you know, then what? Then what are we going to do? You know, then yeah. you have all of it's, you know, you have all of these kids that you've mentored and now they're parents and they're calling you because they're parents and then they do it for the, that. The vision is long term is that, you know, the hope is that all of the kids that go through the program take it and, you know, inspire and develop other students. And then, you know, for our three to five, we're really focusing on tightening the organ, tightening. And we talked about this, I think last week, the evaluation component, how do we set ourselves up for success? How do we make sure that we operate and each kid has that same experience as an organization that that walks into our program? Because you don't want to, you want to make sure if you're capturing data that you, you know, one of the things is that each kid has to have world-class experience. How do you keep the Ritz-Carlton experience with exactly. hundreds and thousands of kids? Yes. So. I love that. We use that That's analogy cool. a lot too. Um, <laughs> you ever think, are you being Ritz-Carlton or La Quinta right now? Yeah. yeah no what no qualms with La Quinta, but yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. I enjoy every time I get the opportunity to speak with you. And I also appreciate that you always make it feel like there's nothing else as important. Like I, that's something I've admired about you for the past, you know, eight years that we've been working <laughs> together and all that is that like with the amount that you have going on from the organization standpoint and in your personal life and all this stuff that you balance, like so gracefully, the fact that you can always be so present and make it seem like there's like really not that much else going on <laughs> has always been something that I'm admire and also appreciative of because it feels, you know, just nice to feel like somebody, um, I think that's a, a takeaway that everyone should, should, pay attention to is just be really present. And so you always are. And I'm very appreciative of it. Oh no, I'm um, very glad to be here. Okay. I, you know, from like kind of key takeaways for me, the, the biggest things were really about like just the, the both bigger picture, but also super practical, you know, points that you talked about as relates to like listening to the community and the voice of the people that you serve and just kind of how you guys have navigated that over the years. I think also talking about like this, like don't try to fit a round peg into a square hole and being open to the idea that like you may have a particular way that you think something will get executed, but like then life happens and how do you evolve with that? And kind of like, as Jill, my mother would say, be the water, not the rock. <laughs> um, and then really just like your guys's approach to, you know, the entrepreneurial approach to building relationships that then drive business, you know, outcomes, if you will, um, that ultimately are like impacting hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And so, again, thank you. And if people want to connect with you or the organization to learn more about what you guys are doing, what is the best way for them to do that? Always email studentacesforleadership.com. I work anywhere I am, um, <laughs> except when I'm coaching 
my and step when I'm with my girls. I coach their ten and under travel softball team too. So it's fun. of course. Um, <laughs> what else do you do? <laughs> but I always email is the best for me. Um, and I Say that love, again. That was it's. Uh, I'll put this in the in the student aces okay. for leadership.com. That's F O R uh, leadership.com. That's the website. My okay. contact information is there. Perfect. Social media. Also, I, we're really good at getting back to whoever it's, I love questions. I love, awesome. you know, the, I think nonprofits don't do it enough. You know, they don't like, I hope that as many people as possible learn from what we're, we're doing and continue to impact lives. So I love it. Well, thank you. And thank you to everybody who has been watching or listening. Uh, you've been listening to the future of impact to make sure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to our show in your favorite podcast player or on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow the future of impact on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. We don't dance yet, but maybe we will one day. <laughs> uh, there you'll find bonus content and sneak peeks on next week's episode. Thanks for listening until next time.